on actor. I want to make it very clear right at the start, and Francis has given a very good introduction to the, to the background to, to ACTA. I am not critical of the European Commission's motives for negotiating ACTA, or even uh, the objectives in terms of negotiating uh, ACTA. The European Union does lose, and uh, it's pointless even trying to put a figure in it because there are no accurate figures for how much is lost, but we do lose, let's put it no stronger, than substantial sums of money uh, through counterfeit and uh, fake goods and, and other breaches of intellectual property rights. There's no question about that, that it damages our economy. I also take the view that here in Europe we are not going to uh, compete in the global economy on the basis of low wages, and I indeed would hope we wouldn't want to compete uh, in the world economy on the basis of low wages. We're not going to compete on the basis of our natural resources, because with one or two exceptions, we're not well endowed now with natural resources. So we compete as a continent on our intellectual uh, ability, on our innovation, inventions, creativity, and so on. And it's right and proper that we should want to protect uh, those assets. So I don't criticise the Commission for going out and negotiating ACTA. I think they were right to do so. But there ends the positives in a sense. Uh, ACTA, firstly, I think was negotiated in an unfortunate manner. It was negotiated behind closed doors and as a former ambassador, the chairman knows very well that that's the way most international treaties are negotiated. But normally there are these position papers, reports about the general content of uh, treaty uh, development. We didn't really know anything about ACTA until almost three years into negotiations. It was really done entirely behind closed doors. The European Parliament pressed for the Commission to make available some documents, some background documents in relation to ACTA, and to generally inform us of the state of negotiations. According to the Commission, and I have no reason to disbelieve them, they were prepared to do that, but it took them some time to get their other negotiating partners to agree to allow them to do that. In fact, it took to the end of 2010 before uh, the Commission was in a position to come and inform the Parliament properly of what was happening inside the Act of Negotiations. There is, apart from the politics of that, there is a legal issue there as well, in that the Lisbon Treaty now puts a clear responsibility on the Commission to inform the Parliament on an informed and timeliest basis of any international trade negotiations that's taking part in. Uh, and yet we do not feel that that, that was satisfactory um, dealt with in relation to uh, the Act of Negotiations. Why, in a sense, do I even bother mentioning that? Well, it's sewered the whole discussion since. It's, imp it's, it's, it's meant that people don't trust much of the reassurances that we're receiving about ACTA. Because it was negotiated behind closed doors, people are now suspicious when vague vaguenesses in the treaty uh, are raised and the Commission has asked for an explanation. People don't entirely accept the Commission's justification. And I'm going to come to, to where we think the treaty is vague to explain that. One other uh, criticism of the treaty, though, before I get down to the, uh, to the structure of the treaty, before I get down to the, some of the individual criticisms, I think if we hadn't had what I've described as apples and pears dealt with in the same treaty, we could have had a much less controversial debate on ACTA. We've dealt with physical goods and virtual goods in the same treaty in identical ways, and they are different products. If we had simply dealt with physical goods, ACTA would probably by now already have been ratified. There are one or two concerns about the way physical goods are, are dealt with in ACTA, but by and large, the physical goods side could have been uh, pushed to one side and accepted. I mean, my concerns about the physical goods would be the responsibility we put in customs officers to identify, for example, generic medicines uh, and uh, separate them from counterfeit and other goods, but that's a problem that exists with or without ACTA. There is an argument that ACTA intensifies that problem because it puts a greater onus on border, border agencies to uh, check for counterfeit uh, products. There's also the question of um, penalties and sanctions that ACTA provides, uh, and there I think some of that is, is, is exaggerated. Um, frankly, I do not believe that if a um, kid in 
suburbs of Athens buys a replica Manchester United strip at four euros, you're actually denying Manchester United a sale that would have been worth 50 euros if they'd bought the proper original uh, branded uh, strip because, in fact, in my view, there wouldn't have been a, share, a sale at all. You've not denied them 50 euros, you've denied them nothing probably. But if you read ACTA and take it literally, the compensation required would be the 50 euros, not the 4 euros or, or the profit made or whatever. So, uh, in pushing to one side, which I'm about to do, the physical goods, I'm not to saying there are no problems with the, the way the physical goods are de dealt with in ACTA, but the main problems of ACTA are how it deals with virtual goods. And now, firstly, uh, I worry that uh, reading ACTA, it appears to put an obligation on in internet service providers to act as the internet police force. Uh, and I'm not in any circumstance in favour of privatising law enforcement and I'm not in favour of privatising in this field either. Once ACTA became public, one of the more extreme, extreme maybe that's, people might want to challenge me afterwards even using that expression in relation to this, but one of the, the more dangerous concepts that was in ACTA, which was definitely in the negotiating phase, the three strikes where that a, a user uh, if identified by the internet service provider three times downloading illegally uh, would have been removed from the internet. That was dropped partly because of public, once ACTA became uh, subject to public scrutiny, that was dropped towards the end of the negotiations. But nevertheless, the existing treaty does put obligations to internet service providers to monitor the usage of the, the internet. Uh, and it's a question of, of whether you believe that the internet service providers are simply, as they would claim, acting like a postal service, where they're simply the vehicle by, by which messages and uh, access to the web uh, passes through, or whether they have an obligation as internet service providers to, to check in advance the organisations that use uh, the, uh, the internet or use their uh, service to be on the internet. To some extent, this was answered by the, uh, I've forgotten the name of it, but the electronic, um, anyway, uh, the European legislation we passed uh, in 2000 uh, on electronic information, where we took the view, as, a, as not just as European Parliament, but as European institutions, that it wasn't internet service providers' uh, duty to have an advanced view of the people using uh, their service but we, we went for what's called is notice and remove uh, procedures. Now, some people, the Commission, uh, to be fair, the Commission will argue that that's all they have in mind with ACTA, that it's simply continuing with notice and remove uh, processes. Uh, there are others who read this opposite and, and take the view that if you look at the, um, the obligations put on ISPs, that they will feel obliged to monitor the usage of the internet and act as a say of the internet police force. So that, that would be our first uh, major criticism. The second one is commercial usage. ACTA clearly out, outlaws uh, stealing uh, other people's intellectual property for commercial usage. I have no problem with that. Uh, I have no problem largely with the existing jurisprudence in that area. And what the Commission say is that, that all, that's all that ACTA does. But if you read ACTA, there is no definition of commercial usage. And this is why I go back to this point about uh, people being suspicious of ACTA because of the way it was negotiated. People ask, well, Commission say it's all about, um, it's all about reinforcing existing European jurisprudence, there'll be no change to European law. Maybe, but ACTA doesn't say that. ACTA simply says that it outlaws commercial usage. And I've put to the Commissioner, I said to the Commissioner, Take my two parliamentary colleagues as an example. If I, and I wouldn't do this, but if I was to download a film illegally and pass it to my two colleagues and they pass it to their children, their friends or whatever, and they pass it to two or three people, and in the end that film in, ends up in the hands of 100, 200 people, has that suddenly become commercial usage? It wasn't my intention. I haven't made any money out of it. Commercial usage isn't defined, and I want to make this clear, isn't defined in ACTA as about making money. It's about the scale of the, the usage. So has that suddenly become commercial usage? I don't think so. I don't think the coach would think so. But ACTA is so vague that it doesn't make that absolutely clear. And if you're passing an international treaty, these things have to be well-defined before you take the risk of, of passing them. And I, 
again, going back to the negotiations, I've said to the Commission that in my view, that if the negotiations had to be more open uh, to public scrutiny before we reached the end, a very simple footnote defining what commercial usage could have saved us a lot of problems. But that footnote is not in the treaty and there's no plans at the moment to put it in the treaty. We then come to the, the issue of, of sanctions. And again, Commission say, and I believe them, that the, there's no purpose in ACTA to criminalise uh, teenagers or other young people uh, using the, the internet. But uh, the, in Article 23 of ACTA, the definition of criminal sanctions is weak and vague, and it is possible that in some countries it could be interpreted as such. And the criminal sanctions will be enforced, of course, by the member states, not by the uh, European Union. There is also, in my view, and all of this is, the whole thing about ACTA, uh, is all of this is subject to interpretation, and subject to, to debate, and people have different interpretations of what each article uh, means, but the, there's also a view that third countries, third parties, could question uh, how sanctions are being applied inside the European Union and challenge through the European courts. And again, push for a stronger and tougher definition of what is uh, first commercial usage and secondly, what the, the appropriate levels of penalties uh, should be. These are, I don't think these are minor issues. They have been exaggerated. Maybe some people here will argue I'm exaggerating them. But unless you have a treaty that it clearly lays these things down, then you're going to be suspect, open to suspicion. If any of you have seen, and I know the, our chairman has, but, uh, and the lawyers among you will certainly have seen them, but if any of you have seen um, international treaties, they are generally about that thick, and sometimes that thick. That's the whole ACTA treaty. That is ACTA. Uh, you might say there's merit in brevity, but we usually say when we talk about international treaties, the devil is in the detail. The problem with ACTA is the devil is in the, the lack of detail, in the lack of definition. Uh, and I, as a politician, uh, and I come back to the, to the balance here, uh, as a politician on balance, I have to judge between uh, the benefits that ACTA might bring, and I think there are benefits, and the threat that it might provide in relation to civil liberties. And on balance, I've come to the view that I should recommend to the European Parliament that ACTA should be rejected. If that happens, if that is course of action is followed, Francis has outlined some of the potential mm -hmm. options. One is that uh, ACTA says that of the 11 signatories, there's, 20, there's 37 countries, but that's 27 EU countries we sign as a single entity. Of the 11 countries, if six go ahead, uh, sorry, 11 signatories, if six of the 11 signatories go ahead, then ACTA comes into force in those, those countries. That may well uh, happen with or without the European Union. Second option is the European Union says no, and everybody else says that without us, it is not worth it. Um, there are mixed opinions on that. I've spoken in Brussels to the Japanese, Australian, New Zealand, uh, and Singaporean ambassadors, and at the moment, three to one, they say uh, they wouldn't go ahead without the European Union signing it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that, that will, in the end, be the case. There is a, a third option which I'm not entirely popular in the European Parliament for saying this, but there is a third option, which one of the other criticisms of ACTA, which could also be a strength, is that in Article 42, it says that this uh, agreement be, may be amended uh, by the parties. Now, this is also one of my worries about ACTA, is that we could sign up for ACTA, and Amendment 42 could be used to change the nature of the, the treaty, uh, and I find that uh, unacceptable. The Commission has given us, on the basis of a gentleman's agreement, an assurance that if we passed ACTA, they would only amend ACTA through a further ratification by the European Parliament. So if they used Article 42, they'd come back for further ratification. But at the moment, for me, that's a further weakness. But where it becomes a strength is if the European Parliament does reject ACTA, there would be the possibility for the European Commission to go back to our negotiating partners and say, OK, the European Parliament's rejected ACTA. Let's look at how we can better define what we mean by commercial uh, usage. Let's clarify what obligations, if any, we're putting on internet service providers to monitor uh, the, their users. Let's uh, be more clear about where and when 
criminal sanctions would apply, where civil uh, actions uh, would apply. Let's deal with um, perhaps in two different treaties, parallel treaties if you like, physical goods and virtual goods. All of that would be an option uh, at the moment, and I understand why they're saying this, because uh, they're still fighting to try and get act accepted by the Parliament. The Commission saying it would not go back and renegotiate any of these terms, it would accept defeat. But um, if I was a betting man, if the European Parliament in July rejects ACTA, the Commission will be returning to its negotiating partners and asking.